five villages post game ramp up now that we have completed our run through of our inaugural chosen men campaign it's time to take a deep breath step back and talk about what happened what we did right what we did wrong what we can do better moving forward before we get into what happened i'll give you guys a brief rundown just to kind of bring everybody up to speed make sure we're all on the same page before we do that, I want to give proper shout-outs to the two players. We've got General Elan for the French, General Urban for the British. Both did a bang-up job. Any errors are strictly the fault of mine. They are certainly not the fault of the players, who threw a number of curveballs at me, which is exactly what we want to see in a game like this. For those of you that are not aware, what we did is we had a three detachments of British running down here, trying to steal a bunch of food for the army, which is camped off to the north. And, of course, the British coming up from the south just want to stop them. They want to deny them the supplies that they would need to run an effective campaign. Let's brighten that up just a little bit. There we go. Now, what went right? Well, we had a lot of fun. We were able to produce three battles, asymmetric battles, fights that you wouldn't ordinarily see if you sat down and drew up these battle plans. What went wrong? Well, that's mostly on, on me. Before we get too much into that, basically the French had too, too uh, high of a hill to climb. Long story short, when you're going to do a kind of campaign like this where one player has victory conditions, run out and grab a bunch of points, and get them back across the finish line, it's really in your best interest to make sure that they have got a surfeit of resources to be able to do that. If we do this again, which I plan on doing, and we may flip the roles, flip the script, what you want to do is give the defenders a couple of big forces, and you give the def the attackers a lot of little forces. I think this game would have flowed a lot better if the British were playing whack-a-mole, if they had too many bases to cover with not enough forces. What that does is it means that the French are able to secure a couple of victory points right off the bat right away nice and easy and then as they go things will get harder and harder as they get penetrate deeper and deeper into the british territory if i were to do this again and and bear in mind one of the difficulties that we had is that in the case of the five villages campaign the french actually had fewer resources in my mind i was thinking well i'll give them fewer resources because they're looking to avoid a fight they just want to get in Yeet the goods and zip on out. Turns out that when you've got a crowded campaign map like this, that doesn't really work so well. Now, one of the things that I did to keep this interesting for everyone is secrets. And I guess it's worth pointing out that the British had a couple and the French had a couple. The British knew the lay of the land a little bit better. And I said, hey, you can drop one unpassable terrain piece anywhere you want. He put a swamp right here. That wound up being a non-factor because most of the action was confined over here to the western half of the map. Uh, the other thing is, I, I think I forgot this, the, the British actually had a medium cannon. and I, I told everybody they had a light, and then I told the British you got a medium, and then I don't think I used a medium cannon the whole time. Oops, not a big deal, just, you know, one of the things to be aware of when you're judging this kind of thing is that the more secrets you have, the more stuff you have to track the more likely it is that you start to forget things and lose track of things. And, of course, the British also had those gorillas that they stuck right here to slow down the French. Now, let's talk a little bit about... So, essentially, the British had four detachments. You know, a speed bump in the gorillas. They weren't strong. They didn't do much, but they did enough. That fourth detachment really made a huge difference in this game. And I really like that the French threw a couple of curveballs at me. One of the things that the French had going in their favor was a spy... And the player said, oh, you know, first thing I'm going to do is the spy is going to change the road signs, road signs here in this village, which would have been a great plan. And it would have worked great if any other detachment had gotten here first. The problem is that just through sheer luck, right, there was a one in three chance the one British guy that got here first recognized that the signs were changed. In the tactical game, he had a power called Lay of the Land, and so that meant that he was familiar with the territory. I think in the video we said he honeymooned here, so he was able to recognize, huh, something is not right here, and he was able to follow his orders to patrol up this road. Just bad luck. That could have gone badly for the British if they had made the right-hand turn instead of the left. It would have opened up this whole side of the board for those cavalry. The French also threw a curveball and said, look, I'm dumping all my cavalry into one detachment. Ooh, 
That was a bit tricky. It didn't work out great. But again, he forego, he, he forewent, I should say, the two free victory points. You know, if it was me and the victory points are the way to win the game, I would have gone and yoinked these and gotten off board right away. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it or not. The, the, the French player did concede the fight. He was like, look, I don't want to play a second day. This didn't work. Let's step back and retool. Can't say as I blame him, given how big of a challenge this was. Um, and he did great, all things considered. So, first thing to do, and then, of course, the, you know, the gorillas, they weren't much, but, man, they were, they were kind of a game-breaker. So, the first thing I would do is I might even just say, look, oh, uh, well, I'm sorry, before we move off the spy thing, the other thing is the spy was able to keep the French player informed of the British positions. I, as the game master, was feeding him information at a much more fre- frequent rate than... I was the British. The British just had to sit there and do nothing. And if we did go on to play the second day, I did tell the French player, hey, here's where all of the British guys are, and here's the reinforcements that they have. Going into the second day, the British had no idea about where the French were. Like, I think he knew they were somewhere over here, but um, I didn't give him full details. So that's one of the ways that you can do this kind of, you know, Featherstonian campaign. But that's really the big takeaway is when you're doing a campaign like this, or, or even if this is a single table, if you've got one team that needs to go out and find things and get off the board, you're going to want, and if the victory conditions are reliant upon capturing as many of those as possible, you're going to want to give them more guys. Mistake on my part. The other issue that needs to be resolved is the issue of the actual victory points. In our rules, we said, here, here's two, here's three victory points, and by the way, they move one square per turn across the countryside. They move two squares via the road. That is ridiculously slow. If you go grab this one right here... And you're moving across the countryside, this farm right here. It's going to take you 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Man, a full day of travel and you're still not there? That's an issue. It's so hard to get the victory points off the board that the French player is forced to just do a brute force battle. Just go knock as many guys off the table as possible. And if you don't win those fights, there's no way you're ever going to get guys off the board because moving at one square, when there are cavalry zipping around at three squares... You're just not going to be able to do that. You're just not going to be able to hide. And that's the other big issue that we talked about a little bit in the videos themselves. Each of these trees is one tree on the tabletop. You've got some tabletops. Like if there's a battle fought here in this 3 by 3 there is no terrain. That is a billiard table. That is a putting green that you're doing a battle on. So if I were to do this again, I think I would just say, look, by default, there is one forest on the table automatically. And then where you have a tree like this, we'll put a second forest on that side of the river just to spruce things up a bit. The other issue, and this kind of ties back into the slowness of the supply wagons, you can see too far over most of this map. Now the idea here was, oh, I got a, a line of trees here. So if you come on over here, remember that sight lines are six squares or ten if you're standing on one of these spider looking hills. That makes the hills important, just for keeping track of where your enemy is, and it does provide an opportunity for you as the player to say, look, my guys are up here, they can see a force over here long before the force can see them, particularly when you've got these trees or villages that are blocking line of sight. Still and all, if you've got a force that is on this hill, they can see basic, they can see most of this side of the table. So there's not as much sneaking about going on, right? And that's one of the things. If, if you were able to sneak this guy off the table along here, run him up along this side of the table, then they're not going to be seen by anybody that's that's you know beyond row eight. So that is a viable strategy, but man, for every square you move over, it becomes twice as likely that they get spotted. So there isn't really enough opportunities for sneaking your boys on and off the table for the guys that are looking to just do a little bit of light foraging. Which is the nice way of saying, um, you know, looting and burning. That really pretty much sums it up. Symmetric forces are no good for a scenario like this. I still think this would be a great map if you had three detachments and you were just doing a straight battle. But that's an issue. The slowness of supplies is an issue. The open sight lines is an issue. And um, what, what was the other one? 
I, I think that's really the big three. So if, to, if I were to do this again, I think what I would do is offer the the looting player a choice. Look, you can stuff three victory points into a wagon that moves three squares on the road and only one square off road. That way it becomes viable. Look, I got three victory points. I don't care if it takes me forever to get them off the board. I'm willing to take that extra time to sneak around and try to slip through the defenses. Alternatively, hey, stick it on a horse and each horse carries one. Uh, one of the things I was hoping to do, I have a number of 15 millimeter pack horses. They would have been great to do kind of an escort scenario. I had anticipated those guys getting run down and having a fight like a rear guard action will let the supplies escape off the back of the table while the battle was still going on. That never really developed because the French player, I think kind of wisely delayed going after victory points in order to kind of clear the searchers from the field so that he could operate with a free hand. And maybe that's the big thing with the second day is by giving the British a little bit of reinforcements and just completely replenishing the French, still wasn't enough. He was still going to have that same difficult time. So probably a smart move on the part of the French player. And that's really, let's see, is there anything else? Uh, Swamp Blocks map, uh, smell stream, just double checking all my little rules here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think we're good. So that's what we did. That's what happened. And that's why we really only had about four. I think this is the fifth episode. We only got three battles out of it. But still, those three battles are just as interesting, if not more so, than any kind of line them up and charge at each other that you'd ever care to see. So if you ever do sit down and dry yourself up a little Featherstonian map like this and decide to do a, a map-based campaign, this is a viable option. Just take to heart the lessons that I've provided for you. This is an experiment. We learned a lot from it. You know, we're not scientists. We don't run experiments so that if they go wrong, we can just explain why that one doesn't count. And now we've got some useful data, and we don't get paid to explain why the data that doesn't support our thesis doesn't count. We get paid to make fun games, and that means we'll take the lessons learned from this. We'll take that data. Oh, these guys are too slow. These guys are too fast. We're going to want to make sure that these are balanced a little bit better. We're going to take that. We're going to make this game a better game to play, and maybe sometime early next year we'll set them up, crash into each other, and have some more fun with Chosen Men and a Featherstonian map-based campaign. Till then, remember guys, I'm praying for you.